And now, Mystery Theater. I'm E.G. Marshall. We have a drama for you, an adaptation of a story written long ago. A lady by the name of Mary Wollstonecraft, dead now for a century and a quarter, accomplished in her lifetime two things for which she is well remembered. She married the poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and she composed the novel Frankenstein. The first brought her misery... The second brought her fame. Though she never married another man, she did write other novels and a goodly number of short stories besides. It is one of these we bring you now. Why tell a tale of impious tempting of providence and soul-subduing humiliation? Why? Answer me. You who are wise in the secrets of human nature, I only know that it is so. And in spite of strong resolve, of a pride that too much masters me, of shame and even of fear, I must speak. Our mystery drama... The Transformation was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Kevin McCarthy. The background for our tale of horror is the proud and beautiful city of Genoa, which looks down upon the blue Mediterranean Sea where the northern coast of Italy curves toward France. It was in Genoa that our hero was born, and on the shore of that sea that his strange adventure, or should we say misadventure, began. I walked to shore. The waves sounded in my ears. The air was gray and dismal. And above the horizon, black clouds loomed. The scene reflected my own mood, misery and desperation flooding over me and a crushing sense of my own helplessness. Memories flitting shadow-like through my tortured mind. Memories of days past when I had lived with my father. I was born with, I freely admit it, a most imperious, haughty and tameless spirit. The words of our confessor, Father Pellegrini, echoed in my head. Your father seems a tyrant to you, Guido. I know that. But you have no mother, and someone must check the wild impetuosity of your character. You must respect your father's wishes, Guido. But I did not. The only hope of my rebel heart was to be a man, free, independent, or, in better words, insolent and domineering. Ah, Guido, Guido, what is to become of you? My father had one friend, a wealthy Genoese noble, the Marchesa Torella, who, in a political tumult, was sent for a time into exile. Like my father, he was a widower with one child a little flower of a child whom he left under my father's guardianship. You will take care of my precious daughter, will you not, Guido? You're several years her senior. You will be her protector, her defender, will you not? I had only nodded my head, but my heart had said much more. My heart had given glad shouts that this exquisite child was to be put into my care. Though words would not come to my lips, this little child, this Juliet, had held out her tiny hand and placed it in mine with such simple trust and affection that then and there I knew I had met my fate. Guido? 
We grew up together, she and I, when I was 11 and Juliet 8 years of age. A cousin of mine, much older than either of us, he seemed to me to be quite a man, took great notice of my playmate, and one day he called her his bride and asked her to marry him. And when she shrank from him, he insisted and drew her towards him. I had watched the odious scene, and with the emotions of a maniac, I threw myself upon it. Oh, I strove to draw his sword. Failing in that, I clung to his neck with a ferocious desire to strangle him. Guido, no! Boys, boys, Guido, lose your hold. I'm ashamed of you. No, no, don't try to explain. I know the bully was trying to force himself on our little Juliet, and I know you had to come to our aid, but Guido... Had you not been too small to draw his sword from his scabbard, who knows what you might have done? Father? Your actions were a great sin. Come with me to the chapel, and we will pray for your impetuous soul. This I did. And that very night I returned to that same chapel, holding little Juliet by the hand, and in that holy place... I profaned her child's lips with an oath that she would be mine forever, forever only mine. Well, those days passed away. After a few years, the Marchesa Torella returned from exile and became wealthier and more prosperous than ever. When I was 17 and Juliet a blossoming 14, my father became gravely ill. As he lay dying, Terela, Juliet, and I stood by his bedside. I know what you seek of me, my friend. That I will take your son to my heart and into my home. You have my word on that. Uh, but there is more. Is there not, my friend? Ah, uh, yes. You wish me to bestow upon your well-loved son the hand of my equally beloved daughter. That is your wish. Is it not, my dear friend? And so it was done. The beautiful child I had so loved from childhood was promised to me against the day when I should be so situated as to claim her for my wife. And now... Now, on the rocky and rain-swept shore, as I walked bent over against the rising wind, the memory of these early feelings returned to mock me, torture me, drive me to a distraction I thought I could not bear. My dreams had vanished. Hope had abandoned me. I had been willing to die there on the shore, to let the rain and the cold congeal my blood and freeze my marrow and end at last a life which had become unbearable. Then, all at once, a gigantic flame pierced my eyelids and made me lift my head to look seaward. The spot where I knelt was locked on one side by a rugged promontory. Round this cape suddenly came, driven by the wind, a vessel. In vain, the mariners tried to force a path for her to the open sea, but the fierce gale drove her on the rocks. Frightful shock, the vessel dashed upon her unseen enemy. In a brief space of time, she went to pieces. I covered my face with my hands and wished with all my heart that I could have sunk beneath the waves with those unfortunates. Then, all at once, I looked up. Something was floating towards the shore. Was that a human form? A human being bestriding a sea chest? A fellow creature saved from a watery grave? <laughs> Was it human? Surely never had such existed before. A misshapen dwarf, I could see it now, with distorted features, a torso as wide as it was long, legs thin as threads and extending an inordinate distance from his body. His arms were the same, and the hands that dangled were tipped with pointed nails that were black all over. I, St. Beelzebub, I have been well matched. And by the peace, here is another ally of the mighty one. To what saint did you offer prayers, friend, if not to mine? Now I could see his face, God in heaven, his face. His head sloped back from his eyes so sharply he could be said to have no forehead at all. 
His hair was black, as were his eyes, but long and growing unevenly over his shriveled pate, and from the backs of his hands, from his legs, and even from the... What a noise the big ocean makes! The waves disturb me! I will have no more of it! And leave our heaven clear! He stretched out his long, lank arms that looked like spider's claws and seemed to embrace the expanse behind him. Was it a miracle? The clouds became broken and fled. The azure sky first peeped out and then spread a field of blue above us. The sea grew calm. Come! Don't be frightened, friend! I am good-humored when pleased. And something does please me in your handsome face. Though you look a little woe-begone. Shall we be friends? He held out his hand. I could not touch it. Oh, well, then. Companions. That will do as well. And now, while I rest after the buffeting, tell me why you wander thus alone and downcast on this wild seashore. Have you no home? I have a home. Then why are you here? I dare not go there. Tell me, is it a woman? What? Did she throw you out? Did she betray you with another? She is the purest, the loveliest, the most faithful. She has done nothing but good, nothing that is not consonant with her noble nature. Well, then why in the name of the devil are you here? At first I could not speak. And then the words started to come. And soon they were flowing in a steady torrent. Before I could marry my Juliet, I must amass a fortune. And before domesticity claimed me, I must see the world. And see it I did. I went to Florence, to Rome, to Naples, and at long last to the bourne of my wishes. To Paris. Paris! (laughs) I was arrogant and self-centered. I loved display, and above all, I threw off all control. I became a spoiled child. Who could control me? Not the letters of Terela. No, only strong necessity in the shape of an empty purse. Oh, poor handsome boy. Acre after acre, estate after estate, I sold. My dress, my jewels, my horses were unrivaled in Paris while the lands of my inheritance passed into the possession of others. Well, go on. I'm caught up in suspense to hear the outcome. I thought that I would come home to Genoa. I was nearly a beggar, yet I would come home and rebuild my fortunes. I knew the moment I went to claim my bride, the world would know me for what I was. Not only a beggar, but one who had beggared himself, a wastrel, a fool. Knowing myself unfit to marry Juliet, according to the proper precepts of Genoese law and custom, I... Oh, how could I have contemplated such a thing? I abducted her. Good, brilliant, inspired! You think so? You think so? I had planned to marry her, carry her off to France, but my plot was discovered... What property I still owned was put in the hands of commissioners to pay at least partially my mountain of debts. Alone, friendless, I came to this shore. And so you see me now. (laughs) How can you laugh so? How can you humiliate me even further? (laughs) Do Do you mean to starve on these rocks and let the birds peck out thy dead eyes while you're betrothed? Is possessed by another. What would you have me do? Revenge thyself, man. Humble thy enemies. Set thy foot on the old man's neck. Possess thyself of his daughter. Oh, had I gold, uh, much could I achieve, but poor I am powerless. You have noticed the sea chest on which I am seated. It was on that chest that you floated to shore. Uh, I shall now dismount. See? A common sea chest, would you say? I have seen many such. Ah, but when I press here, when a spring lurks beneath, see what happens. It flies open. (laughs) Come, closer. Behold. I approach the chest. And, oh, 
Holy Mother. What a sight met my eyes. Blazing jewels, ruby, diamond, sapphire, emerald, beaming gold, pale silver. I trembled head to foot. A wild passion swept over me to possess this treasure which gleamed and glittered within the chest. I looked helplessly at the hairy monster who stood watching me through half-closed eyes. His look, his very attitude told me that he had read my deepest thoughts. <laughs> Can it be that from horror comes beauty? Can hope be born of despair? Even as the winds die down, the thunder ceases, the waves subside, and the wind quietens, there comes the suggestion, only the suggestion, mind you, of the sun's revival, the heralding of a clearer day and a fairer sky. We will be back shortly with Act Two. remember that we left our despairing hero on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea below the city of Genoa. He had poured out the story of his wasted life, his extravagance, his self-indulgence, his profligacy into the ear of a misshapen monster who had survived a shipwreck by floating to land on a small sea chest. It is this chest which the monster has just opened for our hero's inspection. What a sight. Blazing jewels, beaming gold, pale silver. A mad desire to possess this treasure which gleamed and glittered within the chest was born of a sudden within me. Though I was trembling, yet I controlled my voice as best I could. Uh, doubtless, doubtless one so powerful as you could, could do anything, anything at all? Nay, I am not so omnipotent as I seem. Some things I do possess, which you may covet. But I would give them all for a small share of what is yours. As nothing is my sole inheritance, what beside nothing would you have? Your comely face and well-made limbs. You cannot mean what you say. I ask for a loan, not a gift. Lend me your body for three days. Oh. You shall have mine to cage your soul the while. And in payment, my sea chest. Huh? What, what say you to the bargain? Three short days. It may seem to you, listener, incredible that I should lend my ear to this proposition. But in spite of his unnatural ugliness... There was something fascinating in a being whose voice could govern earth, air, and sea. And I did feel the keenest desire to comply. For with that chest, I could command the world. You must realize that if you were to be faithless to our bargain, I would soon die upon these lonely sands. I shall leave you food for survival. But even should I survive... The limbs and body which are still mine would be yours forever. Three days only! <laughs> look, look, look here. Huh? See the blue of these sapphires. See how the rubies glow, the diamonds flash and sparkle. And there is gold enough here for a kingdom, silver to furnish an army. I know little of black magic, for that is surely what you deal in. But I have heard that there must be a spell, and you must know it whereby you, should you play me false, would be obliged to render up what you so unlawfully gained. I mean, my face and form. There is such a spell. And what is that? Your blood and my blood must mingle. Here, here's a dagger. Show me your wrist. Hold it out to me. Ah, ah. I have drawn blood. Now, here is my arm. Take the dagger and cut! I hesitated. It was possible that I contemplated driving the dagger into his heart instead of his wrist. Then making off with his treasure, leaving him to die upon the shingles, his with the sand. 
Or was it that the sight of that bony wrist, that hand with its elongated fingers and their black nails, seemed too repulsive to touch? Cut! 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 Cut, I did. I held the horrid hand and drew the dagger across the skinny wrist until the blood flowed freely. Good, good, good. Now our wrists must lock together. Let our bloods become one. And so we did. In horrid fascination, I watched his blood and mine mix and mingle, yet not quite did they become one. For while the blood from my wrist flowed crimson, the blood of the monster flowed black. I scarcely knew when he separated himself from me. My eyes were fixed upon the treasure chest. I let the jewels run through my fingers. I caressed the gold. I stroked the silver. But as I did so, I saw my hands. Could they really be mine? Long, black, emaciated fingers with long, black nails? Yes, they were now mine. But I comforted myself only for three days. I thought to retire to a cave nearby and there wait out the little time before the monster's return. I picked up the chest awkwardly. So unused was I to my new arms. I entered the cave, set down the chest full of my fortune, and ruminated on my future conduct. I felt a surge of joy, of confidence, and a glad cry escaped my lips. Thank you, my lord God! Oh, horror of horrors! The voice was the voice of the monster. He possessed not only my face, my limbs, but he had taken my voice itself. Two suns had set. The third dawned, slowly paced the bright orb up the eastern sky. Long it lingered in the zenith, and still more slowly wandered down the west. It touched the horizon's verge. It was lost. The evening star shone bright. I thought to myself, he will soon be here. And for the second time, I shouted aloud for joy. At last! At long last! But he came not. By the living heavens, he came not. Night dragged out its weary length, and the sun rose again on the most miserable wretch that ever upbraided its light. I dreamed that I was at Juliet's feet, and she smiled and spoke my name. Guido. Oh, oh, Guido! She had seen my transformation. I awoke with the agony of the nightmare upon me. I would on the instant return to Genoa. That was my resolve. I began to walk towards Genoa. I was somewhat accustomed to my distorted limbs. None were ever so ill-adapted for straightforward movement, and with... Well, it was with infinite difficulty that I proceeded. I tried to avoid the hamlets, for I was unwilling to make a display of my hideousness. But I was not always successful. Uh, oh, what is... What is that? Sweet Savior, what is crawling up the path? It... It's a spider! A spider the size of a man! Maria, get in the house! Quickly! Quickly! I had had the wild notion that I might beg at her house for food, for I had brought none with me. But I understood immediately that there would be no food here. No help of any kind. Wait, Maria! Hand me my broom! Be quick! It's starting to run! Give me my broom! With my spindly arms wrapped around my tiny head and my long, crooked limbs carrying me away from her as fast as they were able, I escaped the enraged woman. I stumbled up the cliffs, searching for a cave where I could hide my repulsive body, and I lay panting on the rock. Below me, the splashing sea, the quiet sand, and above the blue sky of heaven, bruised in body and broken in soul. I rose next morning with the sun and continued my journey. I walked as best I could, but it was dark before I approached the outskirts of Genoa. The weather was so balmy and sweet that I conjectured that the Marchesa and his daughter might have left the city for their country retreat. 
It was from this villa trailer that I had attempted to abduct Juliet. I had spent many an hour reconnoitering the spot and knew each inch of ground well. It was beautifully situated and bosomed in trees. As I drew near, it became evident that my conjecture had been incorrect. The villa trailer was lighted up. Strains of music were wafted toward me by the breeze. The country people were all flocking about. I longed to address someone, to inquire the occasion of so much festivity. But I thought I might, from some hiding place, hear others discourse and in some way gain intelligence of what was going on. So, entering the walls that were in the immediate vicinity to the mansion, I found one dark enough to veil my excessive frightfulness. There, amid the shadows, quivering with fright and dread, I heard footsteps. Two pairs of footsteps approaching along the gravel path. A beautiful night for the gala, Father. A happy omen of tomorrow's ceremony, Marquesa. I do believe it will be a blessed union, Father Pellegrini. Do you not? By all the saints, my friend, I sincerely believe it. Guido has changed, Father. He is truly penitent, truly reformed. I feel that. He is the prodigal returned, Marquesa. Father Pellegrini... It brought tears to my eyes when he so humbly, yet with such dignity, asked permission to call himself my son. And you pardoned him. Ah, with joy and love in my heart. And fast upon the pardon bestowed on him the gift of my lovely child, I... my Juliet. You have acted nobly, Marquesa, with magnanimity. Wisely, too, I trust, Father. I believe so. My heart died with horror. I had done all this. On the morrow, my once promised bride was to pledge her vows to a fiend from hell all because of me, O oh, merciful God. The anguish was too great to bear. And scarce knowing what I intended, I grasped the dagger that the monster had used to sever both our wrists, and I plunged it in my breast. <gasps> does the devil live? How does the devil speak? What does he look like? What powers does he possess? And how may he be disarmed? We know not neither his abode, nor his voice, nor his face or form. Yet, since the inception of the race, we have believed that by some supreme effort he can and must be driven off. We shall return shortly with Act Three. Recall with me now, dear listener, how we left Guido, our gallant cavalier, transformed now into the shape of the most repellent monster, hiding in the shadows of the Villa Torella, where he heard the Marchesa Torella and Father Pellegrini discuss the marriage on the morrow. His long-loved Juliet was to marry the monster who now appeared to be, and everyone believed to be, Guido himself. The anguish was too great to bear, and scarce knowing what I intended, I grasped the dagger and plunged it into my breast. <laughs> I know not how long I lay there in the darkness, but I sensed somehow that the dagger had not pierced my heart. I had not ended my agony, only prolonged it. Then I heard voices. Father Pellegrini and the Marchesa Torella were returning along the gravel path. I had wounded myself badly and, too weak to move, lay directly across the path where they could not fail to see me. Uh, Father, look here. There, on the path. Oh, my sweet savior. What can it be? Is it an animal? Certainly it is nothing human. It's some dead thing, some beast who... Dragged itself from Lord knows where to die in my garden. But what shall we do with it? Don't touch it, Father. But I must make sure. It is foul and putrid. Let it lie there where it is. I'll fetch a servant to take it outside the walls and bury it. A poor creature. Whoever or whatever you are, God have mercy on you. Oh, what? Did I see you still? Is it possible to... Do you still live? Uh, there you moved again. 
You need the doctor for wretch. Hold fast to whatever I feel is in you and I will return. My wretched body had somehow, without my wishing it, responded to the kindness I heard in father's voice. Despite my self-inflicted wound, I somehow raised myself and staggered toward the villa. Wild thought races through my brain. Would God, could God permit the foul union slated for the morrow? I hid myself among the trees. The garden grew deserted. The gates were closed. I staggered about and came under a window. Ah, well did I know it. A soft twilight glimmered in the room. The curtains were half drawn. It was the temple of innocence and beauty. I saw Juliet enter, approach the window beneath which I lurked. Oh, she clasped her hands. She raised her eyes to heaven. Guido. Mine own Guido. Then, as if overcome by the fullness of her own heart, she sank on her knees. Oh, Guido. My only love. What joy the dear Lord has conferred upon me. Oh, let me live only for my life's love, my Guido. My best beloved. I heard a step. A quick, firm step. And soon I saw a young man, richly dressed, young and graceful, to look upon. Yes, by heaven, he was handsome. He had the lithe body, the fine features of... of of myself. I crouched closer. The youth approached. He paused beneath the window. She arose and again looking out, she saw him. Guido. Oh, my love. The guests have gone. My dearest, you must go too. It is not seemly that we should be together like this until after tomorrow's happy meeting. I will not go. Ah, sweet. Could I press one kiss upon thee, I could repose. And then he approached, and I thought he was about to clamber into her chamber. I had hesitated not to terrify her. But now I was no longer master of myself. I rushed forward and threw myself upon him. I cried. Oh, you seven foul-shaped red... Heaven protect us! The dagger was in my hand. I knew that soon the monster and I would be separated... In the midst of my frenzy, there was much calculation. I must fall upon his sword that he did not survive. I cared not for the death blow he might deal against me. I saw his villainous resolve to do this in the sudden thrust he made at me. I threw myself on his sword and at the same time plunged my dagger with a true and desperate aim in his side. We fell together, rolling over each other, and the tide of blood that flowed from the gaping wound of each spilled on the grass. And in the moonlight, I saw that my wound shed blood that was crimson, while from the gash I had made in his side flowed blood that was black. More I saw not, for I had fainted. I returned to life, weak almost to death. I found myself stretched upon a bed. Juliet was kneeling beside it. My Guido. Oh, thank heaven you live. Juliet. My love. The voice in which I spoke was mine own. Mine. Not the horrid screech of the monster, but mine own. My dearest one. My sweet love, I have a strange request to make of you. Anything, my heart. Bring me a mirror. A mirror? I must have a mirror. Oh, do not agitate yourself, my darling. I will fetch you a mirror. But you must not be shocked at what you see. Quickly. Quickly. Here it is. Give it to me. You are wan and pale after last night's encounter. How? Oh, by the mass, I think myself a right proper youth. Your color will return. Do not condemn me. <laughs> no one knows better than I the value of his own body. No one probably except myself after having had it stolen from him. Whatever are you saying? Are you feverish? Perhaps a little. I have endured much. Are you strong enough to see anyone? My father and Father Pellegrini are just outside the door. Ask them to come in. They are so happy that you are recovering. Do come in. He is anxious to see you. Guido, my boy. Marchese. You look well, Guido. A little... 
pale, that's all. The doctor says that in a few weeks' time you will be up and about. And well enough for the wedding ceremony. Do you... Do you have any pain? None at all. Oh, hardly any. And what small pain I may feel... All is washed away by the happiness in my heart. The monstrous creature you killed last night. He is dead. We believe you mortally wounded. You believe? You do not know... There was nothing but a pool of blood. What color was the blood? What color? Why, scarlet red, like any blood. Why do you ask? No reason. There's no reason that I can give you on the instant. And then we heard Juliet calling for her father, and we hurried to her room. And outside her window, we found you. Two deep wounds in your breast, but, praise God, still breathing. I told them how this black monster had sprung out of the darkness with a dagger in his hand. How you had drawn your sword. Wait, 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 all of you. Where? Where is this black monster now? Is he still beneath the window, or has he been carted away? We, we never found him. Never saw him again. Doubtless he crawled the way to die outside the gates. None of the villagers ever caught the sight of him. None. We have inquired of all who were there. Oh, Guido, my dearest, why trouble yourself? I wish to know. I wish to know that he is dead. But why, my darling? One day, when I am stronger... I shall tell you, and you too, Marchesa, and you, Father, all I know of the monster. And so I did. Incoherent as it may have sounded, some weeks later, I talked first to Juliet of the monster and his crimes. But you are raving, Guido. You are still suffering from your wounds, your encounter with the beast. You nearly married him. Hush, my darling. Speak no more of that dreadful encounter. It has left you fevered and distressed. But do not fear, my heart. I shall tend you and nurse you back to health. And once we are wed, you will forget the black monster forever. I did not forget so quickly. I talked next to my future father-in-law, the Marchesa Tarella, who gave more credence to my story. It was the fiend himself, Guido, there can be no doubt. Ah, what a trickster he can be. We all know that. Indeed he can. I find it credible, although I confess it stretches my belief, that he could steal your body from you and come here in your guise. He did, sire. He did. Yet he came so humbly, so penitently. He asked my forgiveness for his sins in such a straightforward way. I confess he took me in completely. Sire, will you believe me when I tell you that what he did is what I would have done? Once I recognized the folly of my ways, will you believe me that on that sandy shore I cursed myself a thousand, a million times over for my overweening pride, for my insufferable vanity, for my stubborn egotism? Will you believe me, sire? My son, with all my heart, I believe you. <laughs> When I told Father Pellegrini the story entire, his idea differed from either Torella's or Juliet's, and it is his interpretation of the strange events that I most favored and favor to this very day. I am of the opinion, Guido, that it was not the fiend, nor any demon, who made the fateful bargain with you that day, your body in exchange for his wealth. No... I think it might rather have been a good, not an evil spirit, sent by your guardian angel to show you the folly of your pride. I did not again visit that strip of sand where I met the monster, nor did I seek for the treasure. The work of my bodily cure and my mental reform went on together. I have never, it is true, wholly recovered my strength. My cheek is paler since. My person a little bent. My wounds still trouble me. And Juliet sometimes, 
alludes bitterly to the malice that caused this change. But I kiss her and tell her all is for the best. I am a more faithful husband. And but for those wounds, never would I have called her mine. Which interpretation of Guido's story do you favor? Juliet's? The Marchesa Torella's? Or Father Pellegrini's? Was it all the product of a fevered brain? Or was the monster in truth a demon from the netherworld bent on destruction? Or was he sent by Guido's guardian angel, a kindly spirit in hideous disguise, to restore to the young man his sanity and good judgment? We leave it to you. I'll be back shortly. said that each one of you may opt for whatever explanation of our story you prefer. Was the monster a vision, a devil, an angel? There is a fourth interpretation which we offer for your consideration. It is from Joseph Conrad, the great Polish writer. The belief in a supernatural source of evil is not necessary. Men alone are quite capable of of every wickedness. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Robert Dryden, Ian Martin, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...